All right, well, let's kick it off and get going. I'm not sure if we're going to get too much more than this today. Um, not a huge audience, nice, cozy little group. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, this morning on the agenda, we've got a, a couple things. And if anybody had any extra topics to bring up that they want to chat about or just generally, generally discuss, feel free to, to add it to the agenda. Um, I asked Saad a few weeks ago to to come to the group today to, to chat about what's going on with, with CSI. Uh, I think we've had our the most recent release is uh, 0.3, and it looks like we're chugging steadily forward towards uh, you know, getting it stabilized in Kubernetes and possibly a, a 1.0. So I asked uh, Saad to kind of chat about <clears throat> what's the latest on 0.3. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll have that discussion, and hopefully we can kind of chat about other things after that that, that people may have questions about for CSI. So um, after that, we'll um, Alex has also been working on a little bit on the white paper. So we can chat about what the progress is there and uh, then open it up for other discussions. So with that, let me hand it over to, to Saad to, to review some of CSI 0.3. All right, thanks, Clint. Um, so yeah, 0 0.30 of the CSI spec uh, came out a few weeks ago. Um, so to put this into context, the first version of CSI 0 0.1 was released uh, at the end of Q4. Uh, and then in uh, Q1, we bumped it to 0 0.2, and now in Q2, we bumped it to 0 0.3. Uh, for those who've been wondering why are we not yet 1.0, the idea was that we um, get the spec to a state that we're happy with and then try to implement it. And uh, that's both as, you know, implement CSI drivers as well as on the CO side for Kubernetes, Mesos, et cetera to discover any issues that we have with the spec, use that to revise the spec. Um, so the first implementation on the Kubernetes side of uh, CSI was uh, in the Q4 release, which was 1.9 uh, of Kubernetes, uh, came out as alpha support for CSI using CSI 0.1. Uh, in Q1 for Kubernetes 1.10, we bumped that support to beta with uh, CSI 0 0.2. Uh, and now we're maintaining uh, 0 0.2. Between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, uh, there were breaking changes. So if you had a driver written, you had to actually go in and update it. Um, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, we've tried to uh, minimize any breaking changes and uh, we've basically eliminated them. Uh, I can talk about some of the changes in 0 0.3. So the big uh, things that went in were, uh, one was the snapshot API. Uh, the snapshot API is uh, designed to basically create, uh, delete, and list snapshot objects. Uh, we already have a create volume, delete volume, and this was uh, following very similar patterns. Uh, you can take a look at the PR if you're curious about exactly what that looks like, but the RPCs are fairly straightforward. Uh, the details of it, of course, took some time uh, to decide. The second feature was um, topology, uh, in particular availability topology. The idea here is that uh, a particular volume may not be equally available across a uh, cluster to all nodes and we want some way to be able to express that when we provision a vo volume to be able to influence where that volume is going to be available uh, as well as after the volume is provisioned be able to uh, be able to uh, understand <clears throat> where it was provisioned uh, and use that information uh, to do intelligent scheduling on the CO side. So if you look at <clears throat> this API um, <clears throat> we have a new plugin capability called accessibility constraints. Uh, if you support it, uh, then you can uh, request topology or you can have optional topology requirements on the create volume call. These topology requirements basically act as constraints limiting where a volume can be uh, accessed from. Uh, note that uh, while this is designed to allow you to specify things like region, zones, racks, the way that this uh, has been expressed in the API is that we never actually refer to ro region, zone, rack. Instead, 
uh, it's uh, an opaque key value where the key can be whatever you uh, whatever makes sense for your storage system. Um, so the one of the challenges is how does the CEO discover what the keys and values are? And uh, for that, what we did is extend uh, the information that we get for a given node to be able to return the labels uh, that should be applied to that node. So if you look for get uh, node, get info. Uh, so node get info will now return a list of uh, topology, basically labels that apply to the node. And then when a CEO decides that it wants to uh, schedule to a particular node, it can take those labels and send them back in on the create uh, volume request side to ensure that a node is uh, scheduled there. And then on the response for create volume, uh, you will get the list of uh, topologies that that volume is accessible from. So this went into the spec uh, in 0 0.3, both uh, snapshots and uh, topology. On the Kubernetes side, we have not finished uh, uh, integrating with this behavior yet. Uh, we're planning to do that for this coming release for 1.12. Um, and then uh, some of the other smaller features uh, were things like we have node get ID, which allowed us to retrieve the ID of a node as understood by a storage system. Uh, what we realized with the topology work and some of the other smaller PRs that went in was that there's additional information for a node that we want uh, and it's not just ID, so we expanded this call to node get info. Uh, but in order to maintain backwards compatibility, we left the node get ID call as is, uh, and we plan to remove that before 1.0, but for now we'll leave it in for backwards compatibility. Uh, we also clarified the probe calls, so there used to be uh, a probe call on uh, uh, both uh, controller as well as uh, uh, node, but we realized that it didn't really make sense and it was not very clear what the purpose of the node call was. Uh, and so we clarified the purpose as being essentially just a health check. Uh, and you can read that PR if you're curious about the details. Um, and now node get info in addition to reporting topology also reports volume limits, meaning the maximum number of volumes that can be attached to a given node. Uh, this information can be used by the CO to uh, make more intelligent scheduling decisions and not, uh, not uh, attach too many workloads to a given node uh, that uh, of a given volume type. So those were the uh, big changes that went in to 0 0.3. There were a bunch of smaller um, clarifications and uh, corrections that we did. Um, for the most part, again, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, uh, there were additive changes, nothing breaking. So your 0 0.2 driver should be compatible. Um, but uh, if you get a chance, uh, do take a look at the 0 0.3 spec and try to update your driver uh, to maybe take advantage of some of these new, uh, some of this new functionality. Um, that's all I have. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I do. Let me wait for the group there to see if anyone else has any questions. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask, so on the, um, one of the, th things I've been following is the topology API bits um, because I think that that's going to be interesting as we're seeing we're seeing a lot more people deploy larger Kubernetes clusters but kind of reserve different nodes for different purposes um, and is, 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 is that kind of where you're, you're sort of seeing the topology question come into play in terms of sort of requests um, so the need, the use cases actually vary uh, a lot. So if you look at uh, cloud providers, they're naturally segmented into, you know, gener generally zones and regions. Uh, and uh, the storage that they make available, their block virtual disk storage tends to not be available, uh, you know, globally. 
Um, it's usually zonal. Uh, and today we have no way to be able to express that in the CSI spec. So that was a big gap that we needed to fill. So that was a big driver. Uh, On-prem, on um, you know, we, there's all sorts of different segmentations of a cluster that you could have, uh, things like racks. Uh, um, so, and storage systems can, ha can be uh, not equally available to all the nodes. So it might be available in a certain rack, a certain, you know, subdivision of that cluster. That was another driver. Uh, clusters being very large, uh, when you have very large clusters, it does make sense to have some sort of natural division inside that cluster. Um, so that is a use case. It wasn't the primary use case when we started looking at topology, but it should, uh, this should help that as well. Got it. Thanks. So Saad, what are the, the big milestones coming up and, and what do you see as um, the path to, to getting to, to 1.0? Yeah, so uh, we want to get to 1.0 right around when the COs are beginning to land their GA uh, releases of CSI. Um, for Kubernetes, we're targeting Q4, uh, possibly slipping into Q1. Um, so, uh, so based just on that, uh, we anticipate CSI going uh, 1.0 by end of year. Um, part of going 1.0 is going to be coming up with things like the certification process for CSI drivers. Uh, that's something that we need to start looking into. We haven't we have a uh, sanity testing suite uh, that, you know, if you have a CSI driver, you can run this test set of unit tests against your driver to, to do a sanity check to make sure that it's implementing the spec correctly. But for a certification suite, we want to expand that and, and maybe have uh, more requirements uh, that must be checked off. Uh, beyond that, uh, we do want to also uh, uh, become an official member of the CNCF. Today, the project is um, still run independently and not officially part of the CNCF, even though that is the goal. Uh, in order to get that ball rolling, we need to get our uh, legal uh, legalese all in order, um, which we're going through at the moment, uh, making sure we've got all the CLAs and things like that from uh, co contributors, that, that sort of thing. Uh, once we have that, we'll get the ball rolling on uh, getting inducted into the CNCF. Uh, and then in terms of uh, the spec itself, uh, I think for the most part with the uh, APIs that we have, we're becoming more and more comfortable with them. Um, we're going to continue to expand that. Uh, for the Kubernetes implementation, for example, we're going to try to implement this quarter support for uh, ephemeral local volumes. So, so far we've support, we focused mostly on remote uh, persistent volumes. And uh, we also want to use CSI to support things like, hey, I want to uh, inject uh, you know, some uh, uh, identity into a pod and uh, the life cycle of that volume is the life cycle of the pod. I don't have an attacher. Uh, how do I make that happen? So we're going to focus on that use case this coming quarter and see if there's any uh, changes that bubble up into the spec. Um, so those are uh, the things to look forward to before 1.0. Do do you know the uh, <clears throat> has has Docker made any uh, like official commitment for CSI implementation within their engine? Yeah, I actually talked to them at DockerCon uh, this a uh, few weeks ago, and uh, so they're they're very much on board uh, with CSI in terms of um, helping guide the designs. They're one of the approvers on the approver list, uh, and they've been very involved with what the API looks like. In terms of actually implementing it, uh, basically what they said was they're not certain yet based on where their product is going. So I believe uh, Docker is uh, trying to be a uh, orchestrator of orchestrators uh, and Kubernetes is one of the orchestrators that it supports. So uh, the indication they gave me was if the support for CSI and these underlying orchestrators like Kubernetes, et cetera, are solid, 
then uh, they don't need to actually go and implement it at their layer. Um, so they're doing a wait and see kind of approach uh, to see if they actually need to re-implement this at their layer or not. Is uh, Do you know who the, the Docker representative is at this point? I think it was Brian. Uh, yes. So it was Brian Goff, Brian left, and he's been replaced by Deep. Uh, let me see if I've got his, his information should be in the approver list. Okay, no problem. Uh, Deep Debroy. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Excellent update, Saad. Thanks so much for jumping on. I really appreciate that. And yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your your attention and and what you, know, you guys have done for uh, for the CSI project. I think it's uh, very important for all the CEOs and very important for customers using cloud native so it's excellent stuff thank you great thanks all right uh so next item on the agenda alex uh, if you wanted to chat a little bit about what you did with the white paper sure so <clears throat> so just to recap the, the white paper that we're that we're trying to put together um is designed to or, or the goals are to, to clarify um, terminology and provide some examples and and how we can how provide information where realistically an end user would be able to compare and contrast the different um, technology areas with regards to some specific attributes of the system um, like availability and scalability and consistency and performance and durability and those sorts of things. Um, and I spent a bit of time thinking about how we would do this because originally we kind of broke down the document in terms of um, having block stores and file, st file systems and object stores and then following on with key value and databases, etc. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more um, the more I was kind of getting confused because what I so the conclusion I came to was most of the storage systems are formed out of a ton of layers, and maybe ten years ago we could make reasonable assumptions that, for example, you know what we used to call a SAN array, and that would present block storage would have a certain set of attributes in, so, in terms of performance or availability or, or, or something like that and you know and a, and a file system or a shared file system will have a certain set of capabilities or attributes but then the more i talked about it um the more i realized that actually it's 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 less about the data interfaces um that define the attributes but more the underlying layers within that storage system or the storage service so so I'm kind of proposing that we that we break this down into into and, and, I, and I put some of this in, into the um, into the document at the moment. Um, do you guys have access to the document? If not, I'll I'll stick it into the chat. Yeah, if you throw it in the chat, that'd be great. There you go. Um, so, since we want to be able to to compare and contrast and give users the ability the, 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 the ability to kind of make decisions based on this, some of the uh, I kind of said, okay, let's put some high level points down together to define what the attributes um, of a storage system were, um, and that covers availability which is you know the ability to do things like failovers and covers things like redundancy and data protection um the scalability which is you know it's it's a bit of a subjective term but i try to define it in terms of the ability of being able to scale the number of clients that can access an interface the, the number of operations that, that can be put through an interface um, and the ability to scale the number of components in the storage system to facilitate a or b um, and then performance again, 
can be subjective, but I've kind of tried to define it in terms of, you know, things like latency or the number of storage operations that are done per second or the number of throughput. Um, and uh, consistency, again, I try to kind of limit it to um, operations, um, the, the, the consistency of, of the data after a write or an update or a delete operation, or the delays that, that can happen between performing those operations and actually getting committed to the, to the volatile, non-volatile store. Um, and then also things like durability, which, which includes some of the functions of, of data protection and redundancy, but also covers areas like you know, checksums and bit rot and, and all of these um, more, more advanced areas, which, which probably need a bit more defining. And then follow that on, um, if we look then at the next page, with the data access interface. So the interface is, what I've tried to do is put each, put a couple of sections together and say what that section defines um, and what it influences. So for example, the data access interface defines how the data is stored and consumed by applications. Um, and that influences the interfaces that you use to manage and provision that stuff. Um, it influences things like availability in terms of moving the data access interface or getting access to the data access interface between nodes. Um, it influences certain things like performance because you know protocols and things like that affect that. Um, and it does influence scalability. And I've kind of tried to group these into two sets, one um, around volumes and one around um, uh, storage services that you access through some sort of API layer. Um, so volumes covers things like block file systems and shared file systems and application APIs covers things like object stores and key value stores and databases. And obviously, these are um, including but not limited to kind of discussions, right? And then after that, I was kind of thinking, well, what are the next set of layers that come into this? Um, so I try to define the, 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 the storage stack or the layers that, that contributes to these things because um, most storage systems are, are no longer, you know, as we discussed, are no longer de defined just by the storage interface. So for example, you can have a file system interface that's backed by an object store. And therefore the file system interface isn't really defining anything around um, scalability or durability. That's actually defined by the backend object store. Um, and then you get into even more complex scenarios where, for example, you know, you could have, a, you could have a file system like cluster that's providing a block interface, which, which, you know, which then is consumed by a front-end file system interface on top of that block interface. So with, with all of those layers in place, I kind of try to limit the, 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 the layers that, that we kind of see in, in normal use. So starting at the, at the very top level, there's like, what does the container or the application see? And that defines how the data ex at the interface is actually consumed by the container. So things like you know the volume namespace and the networking required. There is an orchestrator and, and a host and operating system level. So um, things that define you know that virtualize these interfaces um, within either the orchestrator or the operating system. So things like volume managers and bind bounds and overlay file systems with regards to volumes or, or things like, you know, meshes and load balancers and those sorts of things that can affect those, those application interfaces. And then one layer down, what the transport looks like. So how the data interface is actually talking to whatever the storage system is. Um, and that can be things like, you know, you're accessing local stuff, you're accessing remote stuff. The remote stuff could be point to point, it could be hyper-converged. Um, and then there's the actual storage topology, which defines the architecture of, of, of how the, the actual storage system is running. So you've got sort of um, a couple of options there where you've got things like centralized systems or distributed systems. Um, or, or maybe sharded systems like like Vitesse, for example. Um, and then there are there, there's potentially another layer 
which happens at, at, at the virtualization or, or, or hypervisor or, or perhaps cloud provider layer where um, resources are either accessed directly or the virtualization layer provides some sort of mapping or pooling or connectivity management or failover. Um, and then there are the next layer is sort of how is the actual data protected within the storage system. So things like, um, you know, some of the um, obvious stuff like like RAID and mirroring and replicas and erasure coding, um, but we can sort of beef that up as well. Um, and then there are probably things like data services, which get applied at different levels within the stack. Um, and that can do, you know, the, the, the most obvious ones are things like um, replication or, or, or snapshots, which again can happen at the application layer, at the application API layer, like with the database layer, they can happen at the volume layer, they can happen at the block layer. Um, so I think it's worth defining what, what, what those kind of options are. Um, and then just to, just to um, sort of complete it off, where the data actually ends up sitting then in, in some sort of physical or non-volatile layer. So, and, and, and the main reason for including this is because it's often used in um, service definitions from cloud providers or, or, um, um, or you know, products which, which are available from commercial companies or, or things like that where, where you know, we're talking about in-memory caches or, or non-volatile memory or SSD layers or spinning disk and those sort of things to give you know, a, a little comparison in terms of you know, comparative speeds and comparative differences. Um, so I know that was quite a bit of a, quite a, bit of a long uh, rant, but if, I, I, I'm, I'm very much interested in, in hearing what uh, your feedback is on this. In terms of how, in terms of how we can sort of flesh this out, um, and if you're happy with sort of this kind of um, layout, I can sort of start fleshing out the different sections and the layers, um, and then we can start fleshing out the actual sections um, to give examples of individual block stores and individual file systems and individual object stores and databases and that sort of thing, and flesh out the bottom sections without having to constantly refer to um, how that file system does data protection or how that block store does replication or how that database does scalability or whatever else because we've already kind of defined the generic terms that are available in each of the layers um, um, up front. Comments, questions? So I, <clears throat> I think it's actually a really it's an interesting perspective and you know something new that I haven't heard in our discussion so far is that um, it's complicated is what it comes down to like looking at it from a, a bottom-up perspective or looking at it the way that Quentin laid it out originally in the document I think it provides some information about just a general storage service and what capabilities or how you expect it to act <clears throat> and what you've laid out here is that it's more of a, a top-down vision that, you know, you've got a storage service, but you don't know what's backing it. And, you know, the storage services capabilities are all going to be changed based on how the storage service is actually built. Um, so I think it's, it's actually, a, to me, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, but I'm wondering if the, the information or the complexity that that adds, like if that's valuable to people. And it, <clears throat> and it might be. Um, so that's my, my first comment on it. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a balance. I think, I think we can keep the sections sort of, um, high level enough that, you know, we don't need to go into intimate intricacies. Um, but it's, it, it allows people to, to actually make decisions based on you know availability or protection or, or or consistency or whatever else based on not just how they access the storage but also how it's you know what the different layers in that storage actually provide to it because um you know you you often hear kind of 
you, 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 there are often myths about, oh, well, file systems are slower than block or, or object stores are, are um, higher latency or whatever else. But, but actually, it kind of does depend on how, you, how, how you're accessing an object store, what its protection or erasure coding is, what services are based on it, whether there's load balancers, whether there's, you know, and all of those sorts of things. Um, yeah. Also, I guess tied to my comment, I think what you're saying here too, as well is, you know, the more details that are exposed about how the service is built, like think of the less cloudy it is at the end of the day, because uh, you don't go to a public cloud and get the information about how their their SQL service is built in the back end. You know, what you get as an SLA, and what you know is that hey, if I have a certain type of you know or certain t structured data like this is the type of service that I need to be using to be efficient for my application. But everything else about how the thing is built is, is open to you. Um, so, so on one end, I think it's like the more information we expose, maybe the less relevant it is to the, the general audience who's looking to go you know, stand up an application or build an application that relies on cloud data services because they just will never get that information that helps them understand like how that service was built. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, someone who is, you know, looking to be highly dynamic in how they manage their applications and they do have their own storage team that can help them understand like how something was built and help to make sure it's optimized and you know, set up in the right way. Like, I think that that's also interesting too. Yeah. So I, I kind of talked about that too. So if, if, if we're limiting the landscape to um, just cloud services, that's probably less exciting to most people because you know, a, a, a number of people are, are coming to this um, discussion in terms of you know different projects, for example, that they're that they're also looking to consume. You know, whether it's something like Rook or or, or Cluster or, or Ceph or um, you know perhaps something like Minio or, or, or Vitesse or CockroachDB or, or, or any number of key value stores that, that have been sort of proposed to the talk. Um, and if, if, if we need to kind of define, okay, so, you know, Vitesse is sharded, what does actually sharded mean? Or if we say, um, you know, Minio uses erasure coding, well, what does that actually mean? Um, and, and why would you want to use it? So, so kind of, I, I kind of came at this from let's define the terminology and then we can use that to define the products and services without having to sort of um, explode that information into each and every example. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Anybody else have any comments about it? Yeah, sorry, it took me a while to unmute, but I had one thought that you prompted me to think of, Clint, when you got into the idea that some characteristics uh, mean they're less cloudy. And in a way, to some extent, I think people tend to pigeonhole these stateful storage solutions into just categories that existed in the legacy pre-cloud world, you know, putting them in categories of relational database or whatever. But I think it might be valuable since you made the point that people buy these by service level agreements to just inventory the potential service level agreement characteristics that you ought to use to evaluate a solution. You know, like um, how many IOs can it do per second? What is the actual guarantee for resiliency uh, in terms of uh, uh, fault tolerance within a failure domain? Uh, the backing storage's ability to uh, manage replication across failure domains, including geo regions, and just give people a clue as to what the different accesses are that they should potentially evaluate a cloud uh, storage system on. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Because you know, when when you define those attributes, then there are all sorts of things that, that kind of come into play. Like for example, you know, if you're, if you're using um, say 
uh, an active active database for example as, as as your way of storing systems then perhaps you know your your way of doing availability is influenced by some of the upper layers like perhaps there might be a load balancer there might be an ingress controller there might be a service mesh or whatever else which is actually what is defining your your availability or your failover capability for example um, and and that's why I was kind of trying to put it into layers so that people could see those layers and they could see which which areas like you know consistency and performance and 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 failover and whatever else um, are affected by each layer. Well, Alex, I like it. I think it's a, a good update and a, a good direction. Um, I know that we, we haven't gotten a response from Quinn yet for another couple of weeks, but it might be worth pinging him again on the, the back end and or just uh, wait until he gets back to, to get some more direction before we dive into it further. But I, I think it's gonna, it's, if we approach this from the top down perspective, I think that it's valuable. It's more modern and more valuable and more oriented towards cloud. Um, and I think that, you know, if the white paper is able to be succinct enough while approaching it from top down, uh, like I like that direction, What I'm, what I'm worried about is like just having too much information and too much to discuss in the white paper where it gets watered down. Um, or it's just not possible to, to get it done in a reasonable time frame. So my, my only concern is just the scope creep if we do you know, approach it the way that you're discussing while also including uh, information that Quentin's putting in there too. Mm. I, I, th I agree. I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's probably going to take me two or three weeks to kind of flesh out some of the layers. Um, but then once we have that, that could even, you know, I mean, structurally we could have, we could have it, um, we could have examples of, you know, file block object database, et cetera, um, at the front and even have the layers as, as, a, as, a, um, as just a way of defining the terminology perhaps as, and it could be, you know, structured like a glossary or, or an appendix or something if, if we need to sort of show the, the, high, the, the, the product examples first. Um, I, I was just kind of getting really confused when trying to work through the product examples and trying to figure out how to how to talk about them without talking about all the different layers that can influence what, what that thing can do. Um, yeah, and, and I agree with that too. I think it's a, the right place to, to end up because it's the reality of each implementation of any of these higher level storage services is lots of complexity underneath that, that impacts that the, the actual service. So. I see how you ended up there. Yeah. All right. So um, what what I'll do is I'll I'll, I'll email Quinton and, and obviously if anybody on the group has has any feedback, more than happy to take to take feedback and just feel free to comment on the document as well. Um, and uh, I'll try and finish sure. some more of it for the next meeting. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. That's, that's great work. I appreciate you uh, jumping onto that. Um, all right, so we've got about 20 minutes left. <clears throat> uh, does anybody have anything else they wanted to chat about? I'm also interested in, uh, in other topics that, that folks may want to, to hear about. Uh, I did have the SNIA group reach out. I think that they possibly wanted to, uh, to get a spot to chat about uh, to Redfish. So that might be one that's interesting that's coming up. Um, I know, uh, Go, I see you out there. I don't know if Portworks or, or Alex, like Storage OS, if you guys want to do an update on, on what, what's going on and what you're seeing. That could be another interesting one to, to get on the agenda. Um, anybody have any other interesting things or things that they, they want to see covered or, or groups we, we should be reaching out to for presentations? Actually, that, that might be an interesting prospect. Um, so so um, obviously both Portworks and Storage OS are busy on, on developing uh, CSI implementations, but also um, um, we're, we're contributing to a number of the CSI sanity tests to, to sort of automate driver testing and that sort of thing. So um, I might ping the guys at Portworks and see if we can get a session perhaps in a month's time or something like that to, to talk about where we are in CSI and sort of practical implementations and that kind of thing. Yeah, that could be interesting. 
So, uh, sorry, just a specific question was, uh, are there any other interesting projects that um, we should discuss here? Was that so what you were asking? Well, I think uh, there's a few things. One, I think, uh, you know, we're all working together on other CSI updates and implementations and things to help CSI. So that might be interesting for the storage group. Um, <clears throat> but I think another thing is, uh, you know, where's, where's PortWorks at? Where's Storage OS at? You know, what are we seeing in the industry? What are what are your customers actually really interested in at this point with storage and cloud native? Um, so that might be another interesting topic. And then other than that, you know, what other storage projects, you know, should we be reaching out to that, that we want to hear more about um, in our forum here? Got it. Um, let me, uh, that's a great uh, set of questions. Let me think about that and maybe send it by email. And okay. um, yeah. Fair enough. Okay, does anybody have anything else? All right, we'll call it a meeting. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.